If your creative push has helped you, you can help the show by shopping on Amazon.com. All you have to do is head to yourcreativepush.com slash Amazon. That will take you right there, and you can shop how you normally would. A small percentage of your purchases will go directly to helping cover the costs of creating, hosting, and maintaining your creative push. And especially with the holidays coming up, you can make a big difference just by buying the things you're going to anyway. Again, that's yourcreativepush.com slash Amazon. And thank you for thinking of the show and for helping out. Your Creative Push, episode 181. Ideas don't just come to you like a, like a light bulb turning on. You have to work at them, you know. Welcome to Your Creative Push, the podcast that pushes you to pursue your creative passions. I'm your host, Youngman Brown, and my guest today is Dan Leiderson. Dan is a painter who draws influence from a variety of contemporary and historical sources, from the Renaissance to modern cinema, literature, and popular culture. Both theatrical and satirical, comical and somber, the paintings pose a view of humanity that is steeped in the existential turmoil that lies between materiality and spirituality, where society trudges persistently forward into the future while the human search for meaning and purpose as mortal animals remains unresolved. And Dan, thank you so much for coming on the show today. I really appreciate it. I was wondering, could we start by talking about your kind of your creative origins, uh, your creative upbringing, if you will? Yeah, well, uh, I took a fairly traditional route. I went through the educational avenues of art, got a bachelor's degree in fine art and then a, a master's degree in fine art. And that led to, you know, a career in exhibiting paintings in galleries and museums. Um, I have other avenues of creativity that we can talk about or not music and theater namely, but, um, yeah, as far as the main aspect of my career, the main focus is painting and yeah, just kind of went the way of, of academia. (laughs) Right. And then it it was, you always wanted to be an artist or a kind of a creative person. I know that you, you mentioned the, the acting, which is pretty interesting because you, that's kind of morphed a little bit. Your, your, your interest, not in acting, right? It's more stage production and stuff like that yeah yeah i mean when i was a little kid i was interested in acting i grew up around the theater my mom she was or she is a playwright and director and ran a community theater company when i was a kid so i was always around theater and uh just around creative people and creativity so it was just always part of my life i I, there's no point i decided to be creative um it just was just what i did um i think it was I guess in high school is when I, I took classes in painting and really liked that more than any other creative thing I'd been doing. And, you know, got some good uh, good feedback, got some cash awards from uh, people who enjoyed my paintings. And that I think that was the first thing that made me realize, like, oh, this is something I could actually do. And so that led me to, yeah, major in art when I went to college. And it's all downhill from there. <laughs> all downhill? <laughs> Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, downhill is good and bad, you know. Right. <laughs> yeah, it would just set me on a path of just pursuing art at the cost of some things and at the benefit of other things. Um, so, yeah, it's just, I mean, it wasn't really a choice. I just, you know, I've at various points in my life considered other options other than art and creativity, but uh, it just, no matter what, I consider or no matter what I try, it always comes back to art. Uh, so, I mean, I don't believe in fate, but it, it's, it's hard sometimes to feel like this was anything but, you know, what I was meant to be or do for better or worse. Right. It chooses you in a way. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, now, has your style always kind of remained the same uh, with, with painting? Because uh, you have a very uh, unique style yeah. that is um, and, and unique themes. Like, I think you're paintings are like they're like kind of tragic and um like hilarious Comedic. yeah like yeah. hilarious in a yeah. way um too so uh, has that always been like kind of your your focus or is that kind of uh, developed it's it, it's been consistent for about mm, like nine years now mm-hmm. uh what i do now and have done for yeah you know, like the past nine years is that that kind of balance between tragedy and comedy is is like something I, it took me a while to find. It's, it's basically a reflection of my worldview. I'm like a, I'm a very silly person, but a very, very serious person at the same time. Mm-hmm. So I don't 
put a separation between tragedy and comedy. They're, you know, they, they're one and the same, two sides of the same coin. So yeah, I try to try to put that in my work and like, you know, I always hope that people realize that the paintings aren't jokes and they're not meant to be, you know, just funny. They're, they're very serious, even though there's often very funny things happening in them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Going back to your question, I, I was doing very, very different work, uh, up until yeah, about 2007 when I started kind of working in the vein I'm working in now. And it was really just a matter of kind of finding my voice, digging down into what like I really wanted to say and what I really wanted to do. A lot of experimentation led up to that. A lot of, uh, a lot of dead ends, a lot of failures. So yeah, it took a while, but, uh, now I feel like I've, you know, more or less, it's always, you know, you're always growing and developing and trying new things. But yeah, I've kind of gotten into a groove and of being able to say what I want to say, for lack of better words, uh, through visual art. Yeah. And would you say that, it, I, I definitely agree that you have found a groove. Uh, would you say <laughs> that uh, you struggled more with um, finding like a theme or with like technique? And uh, w- was there ever like a it kind was, of a... Like one wasn't caught up to the other, (laughs) if that makes sense. Yeah, it was a little bit of both. I mean, you, you know, on the technical end, you always just, you know, the more you do something, the better you get. So if I look at paintings I did, uh, you know, 10 years ago, they're definitely not as accomplished technically as what I do now. But they also, yeah, in terms of theme, they were a little muddied. It was unclear what they were about or what I was about, what I was trying to say. And it was really, it was really going to grad school that cleared my head on, on that matter. Um, I, you know, I didn't know it at the time, but before that, I was a little confused as to what I was actually trying to do or what even what I wanted to do with painting. Mm-hmm. I, I think I was trying to make paintings that I thought the art world wanted to see or wanted an artist to make and and not paintings that I really wanted to make. Mm-hmm. And so there was they weren't there was a lack of authenticity in a way in them and a, and a lack of clarity of like who I was and what I was saying with them. So. Yeah, if you, I mean, there's none of that online. I, I don't, I don't show those paintings on my website or or anywhere yeah. else, just because they're not, you know, they're not relevant to what I do now. They were the, the, part of a, a growth process that is just not relevant anymore. But uh, but yeah, no. In in terms of your listeners, I think it's important for people to know that like it takes a while to to get to a point where where you're speaking clearly with your art, whatever form it may take, and you know, you kind of just have to trudge through it. Eventually, you know, if you're honest with yourself and critical of yourself, uh, you get there eventually. Yeah. Like you yeah. said, like the, the technique part of it just comes with time and putting in the time, but also yeah. with what you want to actually say and like figuring out not only like what you want to say as a, as an artist, as a creative person, but what, what you stand for as a human being too. That's just like, yeah. that's just all about like becoming a, <laughs> you know, just growing up, I guess. Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, yeah, it's not, it's not just about art it's about being a person and you know when you're in your early 20s you think you're an adult but 10 years later you realize oh i was just still a kid i didn't know anything and yeah so it takes time takes time to develop and mature both creatively and as a person yeah and and you touch on something really important too that we shouldn't let go is that idea of you know making art for what you think fits into the the art community what you think that other people want to see or what they'll kind of accept with open arms and you, you really kind of sometimes have to ignore that and, and, yeah. and focus on what you want to, to say and how, like how you want to put yourself out there. Absolutely. I mean, especially if you take the academic route, I mean, if, if, if you're not studying art in college or grad school, I think you, you, people tend to be a little more free. They're just doing it because they want to do it and there's nothing else involved. But if you're in an academic environment, I mean, I know some schools are more traditional and focus on, you know, the actual craft of painting the schools I went to, most of the professors themselves came up in a time of abstract expressionism and minimalism and conceptualism. So like a lot of them didn't know traditional drawing and painting skills. So they certainly weren't going to teach it. So the focus was really just on concept. And if you come up as an artist through that environment, especially if you're somebody like me, whose work, you know, I I think my work is conceptual in one, in one sense, but it's also very craft based. So whatever kind of art you make, it's, it's hard to avoid the influences of, of the people who are more established, um, whether they be professors or mentors or whatever. It, 
it's good to listen to them, but on the other sense, you really have to listen to yourself and do what you want to do. And if you're in an academic environment that's trying to guide you towards a, a realm of art that isn't necessarily the one that you want to go down, mm-hmm. I mean, first of all, you may be in, in, in the wrong academic environment. But I mean, you, you know, you, you just have to listen to yourself and stay true to, to what you want. So I don't know. I, I, I forget what the original question that prompted that. Me was, too, but, but it's, yeah. it's, it's all good. No, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I totally agree. And I think that, you know, innovation doesn't really happen if, if, if you're just listening to like the previous, I don't want to say generation, but like what, what other yeah. people are doing and what already works. Like it's impossible to find trailblazers, people that will just kind of do something completely new or it's impossible to do something new yourself if you're just listening to what everybody else is saying and not doing, like you said, kind of what, it, everything comes from inside of you. Like all innovation yeah. comes from inside of you. So you got to just trust that even if it's wrong, like at least you're doing something uh, from your heart. Yeah. And, and, you know, like in, in terms of innovation and, and styles and genres of art, it, it it's kind of cyclical too. I mean, you know, there's an idea with narrative and theater that like every story has already been told. There are no mm-hmm. new stories. It's just the new ways of telling them six basic stories or something. Yeah, (laughs) exactly. Um, and, and, you know, with art, it's like, you know, all all the things that happened in the, in the middle of the last century when things really changed in, in fine art, uh, was a reaction to the things that came before them, namely like figurative art and allegorical painting and all that stuff, you know, impressionism was the first thing that like threw that on its head. And then that, that led to, you know, the 20th century where art movements were just completely changing, like every 10 years or even, even quicker, like it was just constantly evolving. And then at some point, you know, the revolution makes a full circle. And I think people are starting to like realize now that it's not just a forward progression. There, there are ways to, to say new things in like old languages. Mm. That makes sense, you know, and that's kind of what I do. I, I look very much towards the, renaissance and the baroque period and i think of my work as as a way of like using that language to say things about our time and i think there's an interesting there's an interesting aspect to using an you know an established form of communication via visual art to say things about a time that we exist in that I basically look at myself as like what would hieronymus bosch or peter bruegel or caravaggio be painting not that i'm as good as any of those guys but you know what i would i would love to see what those guys would be painting if they were alive now and that's kind of just what i'm attempting to do yeah it's um a sexy way to do it It, it, for lack of a better term like to do it in a style that people already kind of inherently know yeah they know that it's like not current but to like make it current it's it's a really cool cool thing i think that's one of the appeals of your art well it's it's something everybody understands like like uh painting seems you know renaissance painting seems very outdated but it's what led to the invention of photography and photography led to the invention of film and you know film eventually led to the way we interact with everything from phones to tablets to computer mm-hmm. screens so you know this idea of like a two-dimensional rectangle that you look at to experience some altered version of reality is like you know, it started in the Renaissance, but it's completely relevant to how we live now. And so, yeah, I, I don't think that'll ever go away. I mean, maybe it will with <laughs> virtual reality and things like that. The rec- rectangle will become irrelevant. But uh, yeah, I don't know. I think it's, it's, it's an inherent, everybody inherently understands an image on a rectangle. So I think it's like, there are some forms of art that are trying to change the way we look at art. I, I'm doing something different, which is trying to communicate ideas through something that is already established that we all understand how to interact with, with it, which is a, you know, two dimensional rectangle. Right. No, I, yeah. I completely agree. And I do think that virtual, re- virtual reality will, will, will change the way we kind of look at a lot of things. But, yeah. um, I think that painting and, and the, like you said, that, that two dimensional rectangle is always going to be this thing that we can stare at this like moment in time, like this thing that is, that transcends time, you know, like this thing that, yeah. and, and that's why it's really important to decide what you want to put in that, you know, what you want to say with just this still frame essentially. And I think that's why your, your, your art is so powerful because it does send such a message, such like a, a it tells a story. Uh, and I think that's, that's yeah. really cool. 
you talked uh, before about bad habits, or I've read before, like what you wrote, wrote about your bad habits. <laughs> oh, you've about... done your research. Huh? <laughs> well, I think it's really important, though, uh, if you could kind of talk about that, about how you can sometimes spend a lot of time <laughs> doing stuff that you end up throwing away. Because I think that's that's something yeah. that people are afraid to do. They're afraid to kind of take those chances because they're afraid of wasting time. So I yeah. don't know. I'll let you take it from there. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, I, I I don't know what I've what you read about. I know I've talked about bad habits. I don't remember what I said about them. But I think actually what what you mentioned about spending a lot of time on something and then throwing it away mm. that's actually a good habit. Mm. It's dangerous to be too precious with your art and to think, oh, I've invested all this time and energy into this. Like it it must be carried through. At some point, if something's not working, you need to toss it and move on. And uh, I've done that, you know, numerous times. It happens less and less as, as you know, as I move on, I'm, I'm getting better at being able to predict <laughs> if something's going to be a success or a failure. But you need to be constantly critical. You, know, you shouldn't be too hard on yourself. But the way to make good work is to is to be your own critic and constantly evaluate, you know, whether or not it's working. And you know, there are certain things you can say, oh, this isn't working. I, here's what I'm going to do to change it. But it, there are times at some point, if you're making something that you realize, you know, this is a sunk cost, like this is, is it's, it should stop. And, you know, I, that's an important muscle to exercise, which is to, which is to know when to throw in the towel and, and, and start something new. Right. To not see it as wasted time. Like to see it as like this thing yeah. that you need to almost get out of your system and, and to make sure that, you know, it doesn't work. Yeah. I mean, it's not a waste of time. It's valuable. It's a, it's a learning process to, you know, learn from your mistakes and see, oh, I, this isn't working for A, B or C. And now that I know that, I'll try to avoid that mistake in the future. But um, but yeah, I, I think planning is important. I mean, it depends on what type of art you're making um, with with painting. Uh, I more and more do extensive planning before my brush ever hits the canvas so that I really have a good sense of what I'm going to do before I do it. And I usually, these days, I usually know whether or not, by the time I start the painting, whether or not it's going to be something I'm going to want to carry through. So yeah, planning is important. That was actually going to be my next question was, um, you know, when, a, when an idea comes to you, what's that process like? I was going to say, are you, do you go right to the canvas or, or do you plan <laughs> it out? So, that's kind of funny. But, uh, so what is that process like then? Do you like just sketch it out until you kind of have like a, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, the reason I laughed is because, um, ideas, ideas, I wouldn't say ideas come to me. Uh, it's more like I come to the ideas, gotcha. um, like, yeah, I, I guess occasionally an, an image or an idea will just pop in my head and, and then I'll, you know, try to make it physical as best I can. But most of the time, it's it's a, just a long process of, yeah, sketching and reading, looking at other paintings, whether they be historical or contemporary. And it's just, it's, yeah, the planning process is, is, is very long for me. It's just a lot of research, a lot of sketching, putting ideas together and bit by bit. The, the sketch for the painting, you know, comes together. There's a lot of editing involved at that point in the process. And then, you know, by the time I start painting it, that's actually kind of the least creative part of the process for me because it's just a matter of taking the idea that's already pretty much fully formed and, and just making it in a coherent physical piece. Uh, yeah. And, you know, in, in terms of your audience, people looking to like, you know, make their creative process more efficient or, or whatever, it's, I think it's an important thing to keep in mind that ideas, I don't, know, I don't know how other artists work, the ones I know and myself included, ideas don't just come to you like a, like a light bulb turning on. You have to work at them, you know, and you get, you get them eventually. They become fully formed piece by piece, but n like a, a great piece of art, I think rarely just like emerges out of nowhere. You know, it takes work. Right. I know for writing for me, uh, mm -hmm. a lot of times like a, a piece will start from like a quote I imagine somebody saying and it kind of like works around yeah. that. So it's like you see bits and pieces of, of the kind of like you're saying, like coming to an idea, like it's it's there already. And it's just like a matter of, of you kind of filling in the gaps, you know, like figuring out w what what actually the whole piece looks like, you know? Yeah. I imagine it's the same for, for a lot of creative people. Yeah, I think so. 
Um, we talked a little bit before uh, the interview actually about resistances and mm-hmm. you mentioned that you don't have any trouble kind of doing the work because <laughs> you kind of have to because <laughs> you put yourself in that kind of position yeah. where you just have to create a lot of work. Um, but I was wondering, were there any other kind of resistances that you do deal with? Yeah, yeah. So like uh, I mentioned to you before the uh, before we started taping, I, I, I'm in a position where I've, I've, I'm, you know, I'm perpetually overbooking my exhibition schedule. So I don't have the option of, of not working. Um, you know, it's like a, a, a normal job, basically. You can't just be like, oh, I don't feel like working today, so I'm not going to go into work. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I, I have, I do have like, aside from painting, I have other creative ventures that I'm interested in and, you know, maybe more similar to, to what your listeners are looking for. Like I, I have to consciously set aside time to make the creative ventures I want to do that aren't part of my career happen. Um, but yeah, in, in terms of resistance, um, yeah, I think like the the main resistance I face with painting is the moments of self doubt, which you know I think most people deal with, and it's nothing too detrimental <laughs> to my practice. But you know, I occasionally have moments where I question: at this point in my life, I, am I as good as I should be at what I do? Or more serious questions of like, what is even the purpose of art, is this something that's worth basically spending <laughs> almost every waking minute, minute of my life on? <laughs> yeah. Big questions that, you know, are, are hard. I'm a, I'm a pretty logical person in general, and it's kind of hard to attach logic to art because it doesn't necessarily function <laughs> logically. Um, so yeah, I, I think I, I don't face resistance in actually doing the work, but in being enthusiastic about it sometimes i face resistance to that and the yeah I, I think the way to overcome that is just to think about why you're doing what you're doing i get extreme satisfaction out of looking at great art and experiencing great art i mean more than satisfaction really like especially you know my travels to europe like going i'm not a religious person but going into like a catholic church in rome and seeing the just like crazy things that human beings are uh, capable of, you know, in terms of the architecture and the art, like that to me is, is what I imagine a religious experience is to people who have religion. Hmm. And I, I would not want to live a life without that kind of experience. So I don't ever, you know, assume I can (laughs) provide that for other people, but you know, on a small scale, I feel like in some abstract sense, art is important and vital to human existence and you know i that's i don't have i don't know that i have much else to offer (laughs) to to human society so i guess i'm doing my best uh uh, to you know to provide some culture in whatever way that benefits people um you know i the, the results of that are sort of intangible but uh you have to rationalize what you're doing somehow to to keep at it and uh yeah so i i basically yeah, to put it simply, I just I'm trying to make paintings that I want to see. Mm. You know, there's great art out there, but there're also paintings that I haven't seen that I want to see and I'm trying to make them. So, when I'm feeling self-doubt, that's what I just think I'm like, "Oh, I got to do my best to like make what I want to see." And yeah, then then there ends up being satisfaction in that. You nailed it. I think that's like like you said, seeing like the amazing art, the amazing accomplishments that that humans have achieved. I think that's how we can define ourselves as, as humans uh, because we can express ourselves. We can express what's inside of us uh, in this yeah. amazing way that, that transcends time. Um, and yeah, I think you're right that the way to get past that self doubt is just to, to know the, the answer to the big why, you know, like the, why are you doing this? And it's like you said, trying to, trying to make stuff that, that you want to see. I think that's the, the best thing that you can do. Just do it for yourself. Yeah. And, you know, we live in such an amazing time for artists because as impressive as all all that Renaissance art is, if you weren't working for the church or a little bit later on for rich people who, you know, wanted portraits of themselves, <laughs> like y- you had no voice. I mean, there was I mean, there were some other avenues, still life painting. And, but, you know, we live in a time now where, generally speaking, any form of art is accepted. There's no one style. The idea of skill is totally fluid. Um, there's no like one way to be perceived as a good artist and everybody has the freedom to like speak in their own voice that you, we don't, you don't, we don't live in a time anymore where you need permission from rich people or the church or the government to 
speak through art. So, I mean, it's just like, we take it for granted, but like, it's, it's an amazing thing that now we live in a time where you can say anything you want and express yourself uh, through art any way you want. And yeah, it's, it's a great thing. Right. And, and yet, even though we, we do live in that time where you don't need to, you know, be commissioned or be told what to, to mm-hmm. kind of make, uh, people are still scared to do exactly what's in their heart, you know, cause they, they do want that acceptance. It's like, yeah, it's so funny. It's, I mean, it, it, we all want that recognition for things we create, but it's, that's, it, you know, that's a dangerous thing to focus on because, you know, like I mentioned earlier, I spent a while without knowing it, trying to do that and it didn't lead to anything good. You can't gauge your success by by how much money you make or, or how many people are responding well to your work, what critics say, this and that. I mean, in the end, you just you have to do what you want to do. And, you know, if it's a big world. If you get your work out there, there's going to be people who see the world in the same way as you do and appreciate your art. Uh, you won't necessarily, you know, make money or uh, have widespread recognition for being a great artist. But uh you will connect with people. So I think it's just important for people to focus on what they want rather than trying to please other people, because I think ultimately that's frustrating and doesn't lead to (laughs) anything good. Whereas even if you don't make money or get a lot of recognition from your art, if you're speaking with your own voice and coming from a place of authenticity and honesty, even if nobody even sees your art, it's going to be satisfying to you. So yeah. Is that kind of why you don't focus too much on social media? Cause we were talking a little bit before that, before the interview, how you have a yeah. a Facebook page and how that kind of came to be. But, um, <laughs> is that a, like kind of part of the reason where, cause you just don't, it doesn't affect you what, what other people think? I mean, it's most, it's mostly, I don't have anything against social media. It's mostly just, I don't have time. You know, I pretty much spend every waking minute of uh, my life painting at the moment, at least, uh, just to get things done. So I don't, I don't really have time to spend on social media, but yeah, I don't know. There's, have you heard this idea of, uh, uh, people are calling it FOMO (laughs) fear of missing out. Of course. Yeah. (laughs) There's a little aspect of that to me with social media, which is like, cause when I do go on social media, it's usually in the context of art, looking at other artists and exhibitions and what people are up to. And it's hard not to get a sense that like everything's happening all at once Mm. and like it's all out there not related to you and it can be a little overwhelming and make you feel like yeah like you're missing out Mm -hmm. fear of missing out so yeah that i mean that it produces a little bit of anxiety in me like feeling like even if it's not art it's like oh i'm like cooped up in the studio all day long and all my friends are out like traveling and eating good food and, and things like that and then if if it's art, it's like, oh, this exhibition and that exhibition that I'm not a part of. And you tend to focus more on other people's achievements than your own, even though you have them too. It's I mean, it's a, it's, it's a matter of numbers. It's like you're perceiving this unified body of other people doing all these amazing things versus you as one person doing what you're doing. And even if you're doing something great, it'll never amount to the sum of what everybody else is doing. So, hmm. yeah, I don't know. And then that's not to mention... I don't know, social media, especially recently, been a source of (laughs) fake news and Mm -hmm. people arguing vitriolically. And I just, I don't want to that. Yeah, yeah. So it's useful. It's it's useful in some senses. And I'm, you know, I am on there. I'm on Facebook and I interact a bit, but yeah. Yeah, I think you bring up a really good point, though. Like, as far as the negativity, my wife always yells at me for not knowing kind of what's going on in the in the world as a whole because i don't because <laughs> yeah. it's it's so negative based that yeah. i don't want to just kind of absorb all of that negativity you know what i mean um yeah but also you, you're right i think when you see the comings and goings of not not only socially with your friends but also like in the what, what whatever creative realm that you're a part of you're seeing all those things that you're not a part of and then you kind of yeah. p- place yourself on the scale of I guess success, I guess that's what people judge it by, like the number of mm-hmm. followers you have. And that, that really isn't the, the gauge for success. I think what you're doing is right, creating as much as you can and spending all, all of your energy towards the actual creation of it rather than the promotion of it, which, like you said, the fear of missing out with all the different uh, social media things that are coming and going like, oh, my God, like you can't be everywhere yeah. at once anyway. And that would take up all of your time trying to be um, find an audience in all the different platforms. Yeah. And I mean, it's, it's easy for me to 
to tune out a bit from social media. I, I have some people, uh, you know, namely curators and gallery owners who are pushing my work so that I don't have to. Um, right. You know, if you don't have gallery representation or, or curators who want to show your work, then social media is absolutely a valuable tool to get your work out there. Because, I mean, I, I do think that if you make art and don't show it to anybody, that's still a valuable experience. There's, it's intrinsically rewarding. It feels good to have created something. But ultimately, I think most people do want other people to see their work and, and respond to it. And, you know, if you haven't, like, gotten through the gate <laughs> and gotten into the, uh, you know, established art world, then, I mean, it's awesome that you have all this social media to, to just be your own marketer. You can, or not marketer, that puts it in a monetary sense, but, you know, you can, you can get your work seen by as many people as you're willing to connect with. And that's great. So I don't, I don't mean to, you know, I don't, I don't think social media is bad. It's just, you know, it's a personal choice and it's a matter of what you use it for. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it can be a force for good or evil. <laughs> well, and you're all over, in you don't have an Instagram profile, but you're all over Instagram too. If you just search hashtag. <laughs> I've noticed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I was like, where, where's his profile that when I was, when I was looking you up, but uh, yeah, you're still all over. Yeah. I don't have an account, but I'm on Instagram. I'm on Tumblr. I'm on, I mean, I don't even, I, I'm still out of touch. I don't even know what all the, the all the things, new are. things are, but I'm on most of them. <laughs> I got you. <laughs> I'm a weird Japanese meme. <laughs> I found out. Really? Yeah, well, just a bit of one of my paintings. Um, I mean, I don't know if it still is, but a, a while ago, I, I noticed there was something going on in Japan where people were reappropriating just this tiny little section of one of my paintings as like profile photos. It was, it was a painting of like a weird kid with a bowl cut and a beard and all in, in like Japanese social media. It was being constantly recontextualized with like people adding like Santa hats or like sunglasses or just whatever, just like re. Oh, wow. reworking it in various ways and that was super bizarre i still don't understand why or how that happened but <laughs> what is what is that like for you then to, to see that <laughs> i love it i wish i understood yeah <laughs> i wish i understood it more but um yeah i like i like that people are engaging with the work i mean as long as people i'm happy for people to do whatever they want with it as long as somebody's not like fraudulently selling it <laughs> right but do you think that they know that it's that it's you though uh, probably most of them not I, right. I would guess like in that instance uh somebody came across my website or some article about me and then took the image and and then there it, it went <laughs> and then there it went and everybody after that point just had no idea where it came from but uh does that ever affect you though like do you ever feel like ownership to that or like that you should have like credit for that i don't know i, f I feel like i would <laughs> uh no, not really. No. I mean, like I said, as long as, as long as nobody's saying that they, they made, made the thing right. or, or that somebody's, you know, if somebody was like making prints of my paintings and selling them, right. that would, that would bother me. But, uh, honestly, like I, I think I have a pretty small ego <laughs> uh, and I don't, it, to me, my work isn't really about me. Like I'm, I'm pretty private in general and I don't, I don't really put myself out there. I try to get my work out there as much as possible, but I, to me, it's like not, it's not really about me. I don't care if I want, I want recognition for my work because I want the work to get out there and I want, you know, I want my career to keep moving forward. It's, I don't know. It's not about me. It's just about the work. So. Yeah. I think people yeah. can, can gain a lot from, from that, just that sentiment, you know, just huh, having the work good. be like a, a separate part of you that you want to like, push without having to like push yourself as a, as a person, as an artist. Yeah. Although now that I think about it, I, at this point, I feel like me and my work are <laughs> indistinguishable. Right. Yeah. If, if you take my art out of the equation, I don't really know what's left of me at this point. <laughs> right. <laughs> so yeah, well, so that, I guess they're the same. That means you're putting a lot of yourself in there. And I think people can yes. learn from that too. I think that's really important yeah. to, to, like you said, don't, don't do what you think other people want to see, but just put all of yourself into it and, and say what you want to say and then see, see where it goes. Yeah. Um, yeah. well, you said that you're a private person. You don't like to put yourself out there, but I really appreciate you coming on the show and, uh, oh, yeah, you know, my pleasure. putting yourself out there for us and helping us. Cool. And that being said, it's time for the final push. Uh oh. Uh oh. <laughs> this is where I just <laughs> ask you to reach to the microphone and just grab the shoulder of one of the listeners that you've already really inspired today. Just give them your, your best words of advice and really push them to pursue their creative yeah. passions. Okay. Well, yeah, I, 
I think the main thing I would advise to people is is to not wait for inspiration. You know, don't wait for inspiration to find you. Just set aside some time, whether it's an hour or two hours or or more, whatever you can set aside. Set that time aside and then just get started. Even if you're not feeling creative, you know, just get working and the creativity will come. I, creativity and art aren't cause and effect. They're they're more like a feedback loop. So, mm. you know, creativity feeds the art and then the art feeds the creativity and it's 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 all one body. Um so yeah, I think you just need to, you know, get out of your head if you're feeling any kind of barrier and just start making stuff and then the creativity will come out of that. And you know, if you if you put in the time and keep at it, eventually you will create something great, you know. I know I think it's important to keep in mind that creativity should be intrinsically rewarding. Um, you know, it can be difficult or frustrating or painful in the process, but at the end of the day, it should make you feel good about yourself. And if it doesn't, then I don't know, you're probably doing something wrong. So, (laughs) you know, you shouldn't, you shouldn't worry about how your work will be perceived by other people or, you know, whether it'll bring you money or recognition. You just need to make what you want to make. And if you do that, the, uh, the result will be positive in some way. Yeah. Like, like we've been talking about, you can't worry about those kind of other results that aren't even in your control, you know, you just have to create something for yourself. And, and and like you said, you know, it's just getting started, just sitting down, like Stephen Pressfield says, like, put your ass in the chair, make yourself receptive to the muse. And then the muse will eventually show up. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, like I mentioned earlier, I, I just like, you know, I, I get up in the morning and I start working and, you know, you don't always feel creative right away, but once you get at it, for me, it's painting. Once I get at the easel, there's plenty of times where I'm like, oh, I'd still rather be doing something else today. But, you know, usually within 15, 20 minutes, I'm starting to feel creative and inspired and starting to enjoy what I'm doing. So I, I really think it's, yeah, like I think a lot of people, especially people who, people all the time say to me like, oh, I wish I could do that. And I, it just, that boggles my mind. Like why, why you think you can't? It's mm. just because people don't start, you know, once you start, you realize, oh, I can do this. And like, maybe I need to get better. But I think uh, it's faulty reasoning to assume that you're creative or you're inspired and then you make artwork. It's, mm. it's more the reverse. You start making artwork and then that leads you to feel inspired or creative. And then, you know, and then the whole thing keeps building. So, yeah, yeah. just sit down and do it. That's what you need to do. Yeah, those first five minutes when you're when you're starting out are usually the toughest, and then you get into that yeah. flow. Um, that yeah. that transition is is the toughest. Going from you know being stagnant and being <laughs> not do, not being an artist, not not being a creative person, to getting into that flow is is the toughest. When when you're thinking about all the things you could be doing instead, and then uh, yeah. you can get past that. You can get in the flow. It, it makes it so much easier, and time goes away, and, you, and all those thoughts kind of go away. Yeah, yeah. Dan, dude, thank you so much, man, for coming on the show and for giving us that push. Yeah, absolutely. And you can find Dan on his website, which is danliderson.com, D-A-N-L-Y-D-E-R-S-E-N.com. And on Facebook, he is Dan Liderson. And we'll have links to everything at yourcreativepush.com slash Dan Liderson. Dan, thanks again. Thanks. Um, I thank you to Dan again. That was so much fun. Um, But guys, it's so easy to get stopped in your tracks. There's, there's so many things that can stop you from creating something. And it's really frustrating sometimes because so often there's two opposite ends of a specific problem and both ends keep you from creating. Uh, for example, thinking that what you want to create has already been done. Um, but like Dan said, there are seven basic plots. You know, things get recycled. So don't be afraid to tell the same story or the same type of story, uh, whatever kind of stories you tell with your, with your art, with your creative passion. These are tried and true, like, um, like templates or, or scaffolding for what you're trying to create. Because just because something similar has worked for other people, you know, all throughout history, it doesn't mean that you are being unoriginal, you know, just make it whatever it is, just make it and give yourself the opportunity to put your own tweaks on it, to make it your own story. And then on the other end of that same problem, there's the the great fear of originality of doing something, quote, out there that you've never really seen anybody else doing something that's unique 
and hasn't gone through that, that test of those seven basic plots. And I know firsthand how terrifying that is. And that's the entire reason that I, that I made this podcast because of the time that that fear stole from me by, by making me endlessly kind of wait and think about the, the what ifs. And again, it's the same solution. Just, just like the other end of that problem, just make it, uh, whatever it is. Um, if you have to judge, go ahead and judge it, but, but wait until after you've created it and you can, you can look at it or touch it or hold it or, or listen to it, judge it then, uh, not when it's just some idea in your head. And the other really important point uh, of the many important points that Dan made was uh, this idea of FOMO, the fear of missing out and how it can sometimes really overwhelm you into doing nothing. Think about all of the people that you compare yourself with, sometimes on a daily basis, and each of them has their own achievements. Each of them has the, their own thing that they're doing, their own accomplishments. But like Dan said, you are just one person with one body of work or one developing body of work. Um, so you have to stop comparing yourself to all of those people. You're being completely and totally unfair to yourself. So stop thinking that you're missing out on their achievements, um, all of them as one collective body, like he was saying, and just start focusing on your own achievements. It's bad enough to compare yourself to each individual person, but when you're comparing yourself to many uh, different people on a daily basis, there's going to be a lot of things that you're not going to be able to get to. You're only one person, so just stop doing that and really start focusing on what you have to offer and what you are successfully creating. Uh, hopefully, this podcast is helping you to do that. So, That being said, I do hope that you are inspired to go and get your work done, so go and get it done. And we will be here for you on Monday if you need the push again. I hope that you have a wonderful Christmas if you celebrate it. I hope that you have a wonderful holiday. And I hope that you are able to find some time off as well as some time to get to your creative passions. Uh, but until then, be safe. I love you all. And we will see you on Monday. Bye. Never miss a push. Head to yourcreativepush.com slash subscribe to find the easiest way for you to subscribe to the podcast.